Who loves a good courtroom drama, right? Can, let's, let's do like we do with the youth. How about everybody shout out one of your favorites? It could be a TV show or a movie. I'm fine. Courtroom drama. Ready? Go. <laughs> the first thing, the first thing I heard, Perry Mason. I was expecting some Matlock. Who threw out Matlock? Yeah, the back crew over here. I thought Ben would throw out Matlock. He's an Andy Griffith guy. <laughs> I heard a few good men here in the front. I heard a few good men. I heard a, I'm not sure if I heard it, but I, Carmen loves Law and Order. She's always, dun, dun. She's always watching that. I hear it from the other room. To Kill a Mockingbird. How about Jag? Anybody watch Jag a few years back? Twelve Angry Men going way back in time. Yeah? I had to Google that. I don't know what it is. Anything by John Grisham. You got Runaway Jury, The Client, Time to Kill. Great movies, great TV shows. I'm into one right now. Uh, I'm into a, a one that I had not actually even heard of until I saw it on one of those streaming media things you can do. It's called Suits. Has anyone watched Suits? Suits is really good. I like it. It's, it's, uh, it's great because it's clean. And you don't see a whole lot of clean shows these days. <clears throat> and on Suits, the, the, the premise is it's this young brilliant guy, <laughs> just saying, uh, young, brilliant guy, he's, he's not a lawyer, but he's pretending to be one, and he gets hooked up in the best law firm in New York City, or what they say is the best law firm, and he gets mentored by a guy named Harvey Specter, and Harvey Specter is a tough character, he doesn't show a lot of emotion, he doesn't show a lot of empathy, he just cares about one thing, winning. And here's what we can take to the bank in, if you watch the movie Suits. If you are a client represented by Harvey Specter, you're not going to lose. He's going to win. right? He is going to win. I like that show a lot. And, and, and one thing I've learned in a, when I watch the show, and this is probably on some of these other shows and movies as well, is it really helps to have the judge on your side, doesn't it? If you're going into a lawsuit, it, it, it helps if you play golf with the judge. That'll probably help you out. Or if you have some dirt on the judge, that's even better in some of these shows. But we're going to talk about a judge tonight who you can't have any dirt on. He doesn't have any dirt. But I do have good news for you. The judge is not just on your side. He's also your defense attorney. If you're in Christ, you can't lose. You can't lose. This is good news. Let's dive into the text Romans 8, we're starting in verse 31, and we'll go ahead and read all the way till the end, and then we'll come back and talk about it. What then shall we say to these things? Basically, in light of this whole chapter, what do we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is profoundly good news. So let's deal with it. I want to show you two quick thoughts. I want to show you what love has done, and I want to show you what love has won. And right, we'll start with what love has done. Love has done. It set us free from condemnation. You remember verse 1? That's the very beginning of the chapter. You, if you are in Christ, you are now, therefore, there is no condemnation for you. You are free from condemnation. And, and Paul is unfolding an argument in the first four verses, and it's, it kind of reminds me of a courtroom scene. It uses some of that courtroom language, like who can bring a charge. That, that literally means to prosecute. Who can prosecute those whom God loves? 
And the answer, of course, is a resounding no one. But you know, somebody does try. And we'll get into that. But the argument here is God's sovereign grace defends us from condemnation. God's grace defends us from condemnation. We start with these words. If God is for us. That rings loudly through this text. If God is for us, what can be against us? That is the shortest explanation of the gospel in the Bible. Or one of them. God is for us. Four words. Packed with gospel truth. And if you want to see how is God for us, just rewind. You can start at the beginning. God is for us and that he removes condemnation. God is for us and he sent his son to do what the flesh could not do, what it was weakened by the law. He sent his son to pay the penalty for sin on your behalf. He sent the spirit to indwell believers, to lead them into truth, to lead them in the fight against sin. He he sends His Spirit to help us in all kinds of ways, Romans 8 says. He helps us in our prayers. He helps us in our sufferings. He helps us have assurance that we belong to God in Christ. God is for us, Paul says. This is great news. He's been telling us this the entire time. We've been hearing this all week. We just haven't used those words. God is for us because of what Jesus did on our behalf. Because of what Jesus did. The argument here is simple. God is for us. He, his grace defends us from condemnation. Hear these words from a man named James Edwards. God is for us. Is not a conceptual statement of God's gracious disposition. It's a historical statement testifying to God's actions on our behalf. This is no theory, he says. This is no theory. This God is for us thing is not just because God has an attitude that loves us. No, we know God is for us because he sent his son to march up Calvary's hill and lay his life down on your behalf. That's how we know God is for us. So as this courtroom drama unfolds here, we're going to see several people involved in the process. Let's look at the attorneys. The attorneys, there is an accuser. Now, the argument here Paul's making is that the accusation holds no weight. But there is an accuser. His name's Satan. We know that because the word Satan actually means accuser. That's what he does, and there's several examples in the scriptures for that. Look at, or you can you could look further later at Romans or Revelation 12:10, where Satan is called the accuser of our brothers. In Zechariah chapter 3, Satan brings a charge against Joshua the high priest. And God defends him and clothes him with honor, with righteousness. That's a powerful story. Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. In Job 1, 10 through 11, Satan accuses Job. How does he accuse him? He he says, "I, I promise you, God, if you let this man suffer, you're going to see he will turn on you. That's an accusation. And how did that turn out for him? See, Satan's a pretty poor accuser, I guess, because he's 0 for 3 in that situation. He has no charge to bring against God's elect, against God's kids. He has no charge against those who are indwelled by the Spirit. His accusations fall flat on the floor. And here's why. Because God the Father is the defense attorney. God the Father is the defense attorney. And it's almost like cheating because he's also the judge. He's the defense attorney and the judge. The title of this message is, The judge is my defense. We sang that in the first song this evening, and that is powerful news. Let's read uh, 32 and 33 again. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God who justifies. He's, that's what a, a defense attorney does. He, he, he tries to justify the one whom he defends to make it show, to make the record show that he is not guilty. And in Christ, God has fully, finally, perfectly, completely shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you are in Christ, you are not guilty. I can prove it. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. Hang out in Romans 8. We're not leaving. 
Colossians chapter 2, we'll refer to this here again in just a second. Starting in verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That's how God justifies. That's how he defends. He takes that record of debt. He enters that courtroom and says, you know, this debt, it is true. You owe. But I'm nailing this to the cross. That debt has been paid. He stands righteous before God. She stands holy before God because of Jesus' death. So the attorney, Satan is the prosecutor, God is the defense attorney, and Jesus is the star witness. And God's going to call him to the stand in verse 34. Look at it with me. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So you see the personnel here? You see that the accuser comes to make a charge against you. That's going to happen in your life. I can promise you that right now you will have some moments where you feel like maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I don't know God. Maybe I'm, I'm not growing the way I know I should be. So do I really belong to Christ? He's going to whisper those accusations into your ear. I promise you because he's whispered them into mine. Has he whispered them to you? Do you are you familiar with these accusations? He's going to make them before God and say, he is not a child of God. And God will point to that record of debt nailed to the cross and say, yes, he is. Yes, she is. They're mine. And nothing can come against them. All the accusations fall flat. He has evidence. Here's the evidence. Verses 32 and 33 make some things very plain, very true, very simple. First, God gave up his son to pay the penalty for our sins. God gave up his son to pay the penalty for our sins. You could look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that you could become the righteousness of God. He gave up his son for your sin to pay. How could he pay? Because he was perfect. He was not with sin. He was sinless, and therefore he could offer himself as a substitute for all of us sinners. Next, he gives us his continued grace. God gives us his continued grace. It says, if God has sent his son, how will he not also give us all things? If God has already paid the ultimate price for you, is he going to quibble over some other little thing? No. You're his kids. You get the best. You get every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, as we've said several times this week. God continues his grace in our life. He's a good, good father. God chooses and justifies sinners. He chooses and justifies sinners. You look at verse 33. It's there in the text. Elect, that word means select, favorite, chosen. Remember verses 29 and 30. God's sovereign grace on our behalf. If God does all that for us, here's your argument. If God does all that for us, who could possibly raise a charge against us? Who could possibly succeed in a charge against us? So you have your team. You have your evidence and here's the defense Jesus himself Jesus himself he is the gospel verse 34 says these four truths very simply number one Jesus died for us Jesus died for us he canceled our debt with his perfect life he triumphed over evil on the cross and when he finished when he hung his head he yelled out the words it is finished literally paid in full That's the words they would stamp on a receipt when you paid up your debt. They would stamp the word to tell us that it is finished, paid, covered, canceled, over. You no longer owe the flesh if you're in the spirit. You no longer owe the flesh. That's been covered. Jesus died for you, but more than that, Jesus was raised to new life. Jesus was raised to new life. He's he's not dead any longer. This is the thing that separates us from every other faith system on this earth. You know, you can go visit a lot of other graves of a lot of other gods. You could maybe visit 
the tomb that Jesus laid in, but he's not there anymore. You could go pay respect to Muhammad's bones. They're still over there. You could go pay respect to Buddha's body. It's, it's still decomposing in the ground, I think. I don't know how that works, but he never ascended to the right hand of the Father, that's for sure. There's an empty tomb in the Middle East and an occupied throne in heaven. That's good news. Jesus was exalted to the right hand of the Father. Jesus was exalted to the right hand of the Father. Acts 5.31 would say it this way. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Well, that's good news. I want to read it again. God exalted him in his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. He grants us forgiveness. And lastly, in this section, God intercede, Jesus intercedes on our behalf. He represents us to the Father. He is sitting next to the throne of God the Father, and he is whispering into, into God's ear. Whenever an accusation comes up, he says, no, no, not guilty. No, no, I paid for that. No, no, that sin, it's covered. That's canceled. He's innocent. He's righteous. He's just because of me. Can you imagine him sitting there, accusations come, and he just leans over and says, no, 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 covered. Not guilty. What good news? What good news? Kent Hughes would say it this way. If accusations are brought against us, we need not fear, for the charges are silenced by the upraised, pierced hands of our intercessor. The charges against you are silenced by the upraised, pierced hands of our intercessor, Jesus. You don't need any more evidence than that. Case, close, case, dismiss. This thing is over you. If you are in Christ, you are not guilty anymore. You are free to live by the Spirit. You are free to be more than a conqueror through Christ. The accuser stands no chance. The judge is our defense. We're going free. Number two, what love has won? Anyone care to take a stab at that blank? What love has won? Everything. Everything. What love has won? Everything. Starting in verse 35, let's read that together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? All these things can come against us, but none of them can succeed at separating you from the love of God in Christ. See, we have security from worldly sufferings. That's what Paul's saying here. We have security from worldly sufferings. We have security from suffering and persecution. Those first three phrases, tribulation, distress, persecution. Paul is all too familiar with these things. He's all too familiar with these circumstances. He knows how it feels to suffer. He knows how it feels to be persecuted. And he's saying that if you're in Christ like Paul was in Christ, nothing can actually defeat you. Oh, it might take your life, but to die is gain, right? You want to see the record of the things that came against Paul in his lifetime? Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just a couple of, uh, chapters over to the right. He's going to give you his resume of sufferings. I've heard it a uh, catalog of catastrophes. Is that your phrase, Pastor Ken? Catalog of catastrophes. I like that a lot. <clears throat> Starting in verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. I love that. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, 
there's daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Wow. Anyone want to trade places with Paul? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I stub my toe and cry for a week. <laughs> Beaten with rods three times? Five times whipped? 39 times each? That's like a lot of times. Shipwrecks? He didn't even mention the snake bite. You remember that. There was one city. He was stoned. They thought he was dead. How, how wounded would you have to be for someone to think, literally think that you are dead? Pretty hurt. He's lying on the ground. He comes to, and he gets up, and just, some of his followers are with him, and he, he says, okay, time to go back in the city. And they're like, Paul, you need to lay down. You need to rest up. Let's just get on the boat, go to the next place. You can rest up, and we'll preach at the next city. No, the very next day, he went right back into the city. Would that be your strategy? No. Paul knows what it means to suffer. But Paul has been clued into a little secret. The sufferings of this present world are not worth comparing to the glory that is to come. For Paul to live is Christ. Yes, that's why he went through all of that. So he could go from city to city to city to tell them the good news that God loves them, that he wants to save them, and he's sent his son to die for them, and they can be free in Christ. That's to live as Christ. He was making a difference, making an impact. He was, he was going and preaching and winning souls for the Lord, but he knew not just as to, live, to live as Christ, but to die as gain. Can you imagine how frustrating it would be to, be, to oppose Paul? You, you've heard it some. He has this whole list. Clearly, he's not afraid of danger. He used the word danger a, a kajillion times in that text. But, you know, they could say, hey, Paul, we're going to beat you. Be like, That's fine. I'll just come back tomorrow. Hey, Paul, we're going to throw you in prison. That's cool. I'll convert all your guards. We'll start singing worship songs. We'll start singing Cornerstone by Hillsong, and the walls will just bust off this place, and we'll just leave the next day. Hey, Paul, we'll kill you hey, to, to die as gain. Okay, we'll let you live to live as Christ. Can you imagine having that perspective? So, so here's a little application for you. You ready? In love and graciousness as much as I can bear. Hey, stop whining. Stop whining. What is your earthly problem? Now, we know our sufferings are real, but let's be honest with ourselves. God has prepared for us an eternal weight of glory. And in the meantime, we can go make disciples of all nations and we can share the good news of Jesus. And so what if they punch us in the face? That'll heal up. So what if they throw us in prison? At least we get three meals. And in the United States, there's a whole lot of people in prison. We could preach for days and days and days and still have tons of people to preach to. So what if they kill you to die as gain? Paul understands this. I want you to have some courage here. Some courage. What's the worst thing they could do with you? Send you to be with Jesus forever? Boy, that sounds terrible. That sounds terrible. So there's suffering and persecution here in this list. There's also scarce resources. Famine and nakedness, scarce resources. You know, God uses those moments where you have scarce resources to help you learn to trust Him, to help you learn to trust in His provision. Hey, I, I'm an MK. I know all about scarce resources. I know all about praising God because somebody brought us peanut butter. That was some good news in the White Household. Some of you know about scarce provisions. Some of you have really been worried about that bank account. It's coming down to the wire, and you're not sure if you're going to be able to make it to the end of the month. You've been there, haven't you? Some of you have been way even worse off. Some, I've heard stories that Mr. Stanley has told about his childhood. They, they didn't have hardly anything, but I, I know Stanley well enough to know that he has joy, if nothing else. What are scarce resources? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He gives you anything you need to... That's good for you, really. Paul learned this firsthand in Philippians chapter 4. You can read the whole chapters about this. You know that verse that all the rappers say at the Grammys, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength? 
that every athlete says so they can get a next first down. You know what that text is really about? Learning how to deal with bad times. Paul knew how to abound. Paul knew how to be abased. Paul knew how to suffer. He knew how to go without. He knew how to be hungry. And in all things, he knew how to rely on the Lord. That's why he could say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And this text is a resounding amen. We can endure all things because we have Jesus. We have Jesus. So we might have to deal with scarce resources. We might have to deal with danger. Danger won't separate you from the love of Christ. In fact, it'll likely draw you nearer to him. What's that very, very famous phrase from old times? There are no atheists in foxholes. Hey, if you're in Christ and the bullets start whizzing past your head, I bet you might say a prayer. I bet you God will use that to draw you nearer to himself. Danger will force you to pray, and it will force you to trust in God. It will force you. Paul knows what it means. Jesus knew what it mean, meant to be in danger for his own life. Some of us have been there. Don't despair. Don't despair. Can I talk to parents for a second? I believe that God is going to call some of your children to the mission field. I, I want you to know, I've prayed for that. I hope they go. I hope they risk it all for the sake of Christ. I've asked God many times if I could go and be a missionary overseas, and it seems clear to me that my call was to equip and to inspire others to go. It seems clear to me. I've asked him over and over, God, send me, send me, send me. He's like, I did. You're right where I want you to be. But I've prayed for that, parents. And if they do make that decision, I hope that you rejoice. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to fear. What can they possibly do? Kill your kids? Well, amen. Because they get Jesus a little quicker than you. Like Paul, I know, I'm talking like a madman. Danger will force you. There's also the sword. This isn't talking about a battle. This is talking about execution. That word is for dagger, execution. Paul himself would face this very reality in this very city to whom he writes this very letter. According to tradition, Paul was put to death by the sword in Rome. He knew a little bit of something about being afraid for his life, didn't he? But he knows that to die is not loss, it's gain. So we have security from worldly sufferings. All of that could never separate us from God's love. None of it could separate us from God's love. We also have peace in the midst of persecution. Peace in the midst of persecution. Look at verse 36. I've honestly always wondered why this was in this text. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul counts persecution as a present and guaranteed reality. A present and guaranteed reality. He quotes Psalm 44, 22 here, showing that this has always been true. Even back in the Old Testament, this has always been true. People have always hated God. But that doesn't take away our responsibility to live for him and to proclaim his name. We might be led to the slaughter. But that can't separate us from the love of Christ. That can't separate us from him. God's people since the beginning of time have had to cope with this reality of persecution. And here's some good news. God is the only source of strength that you need. God is the only source of strength that you need. I, I can think of one of my favorite uh, church history people, Martin Luther. Martin Luther, I like Martin Luther because he was never afraid to say what he thought that the Bible said. He was never, he would never, ever back down. He was a little tough. I, I'm not sure if I'd be best buddies with him, but maybe. I do, I've heard that he had a bowling alley in his house. That's a true thing. I've heard that he was the first to have a bowling alley in his house, and he's also been attributed with the Christmas tree. That guy was probably really fun. So here's what happened. Martin Luther opposed the Catholic Church. He opposed corruption, in particular in the Catholic Church. He actually never wanted to leave the Catholic Church. He just wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He wanted them to start reading the Bible again. 
Because only the priests would be able to have the Bible, and they would read it in a language that the people didn't even understand. He wanted the people to know God's Word. What a novel idea. Seems not so radical now. But if the people had God's Word, they would, knew, they would know that the priests and the Pope were disobeying God's Word and taking advantage of God's kids. And so Martin Luther went to trial at this place called the Diet of Worms, spelled like worms, and that's a really funny phrase to me. So he has to stand in front of a council. And at this council, they ask him to recant, to take it back. You've written all these things against the Pope. You've written all these things against the Catholic Church. You've written all these things that are ruffling a lot of feathers. Take it back or we'll kill you. Or at the very least, we'll exile you. And here's what Martin Luther said. And it's a paraphrase, okay? Unless you can convince me by plain reason and God's word, I will not and I cannot. And this is a quote. Here I stand. Help me, God. I can do no other. Now that day he did not face the sword. But that's courage. That's courage that's not from himself. That's courage that's from God alone. That's God being the source of strength. And this is happening all over the world today, friends. You need to know. There are people, there are Coptic believers overseas right now being put to the sword by ISIS. And I was reading about them the other day, and you know what a lot of them, their last words are, or have been, or, or were? Jesus Christ is Lord. Isn't that good news? Now, we should be praying for them. Yes, absolutely. But some of us should be going to them and going to ISIS and saying, hey, you can be saved. But wouldn't that put us in danger? For your earthly life, yes. But it would give them hope. It would give them access to the gospel. Those Coptic believers are standing firm in the strength of God because they know He's worth it. He's worth it. And they know, they know for sure with Paul that the sword can never separate them from the love of God. They can take their lives, but they can never take their souls. They could take their lives, but they could never send them to hell. I pray that we would have this sort of courage because this is a bit of opinion here. I think it's coming for us one day. I don't know when and I don't know to what degree, but I do know it's becoming less and less favorable, less and less fashionable to be a Christian. Why? Well, Jesus told us a long time ago, the world hates him and they're going to hate us too. And I pray that you have courage to stand on the conviction of God's word and say, Jesus Christ is Lord, even if it means you kill me. You can't send me to hell. You can just send me to heaven a little faster. So we have security from worldly sufferings. We have peace in the midst of persecution. We have victory through Christ against all assailants. Against all assailants. Look at verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. That word in the Greek is hyper, and then I forget what the word for conquerors is. So the beginning of that word is hyper, which means super, extra, or more powerful conquerors. I just want to declare to you today, based on God's word, that if you are in Christ, you are a super conqueror. You seem way less excited than me. I'm really excited about that. In Christ, you're a super conqueror. Nothing formed against you shall stand. Because God has the whole world in His hand. We just sang that a minute ago. You are a super conqueror in Christ. Nothing can separate you. Nothing can ultimately defeat you. Yeah, it can hurt you. Yeah, it can kill you. Yeah, it can make you uncomfortable for a while. But how about we lay down our idols of comfort? How about we lay down our idols of wealth? And how about we lay down our idols of security and just be passionate and courageous and bold for the sake of God's name because we are super conquerors in Christ. There's nothing they can do to stop the good news of the gospel. The gates of hell will never prevail against the church. 
So can we take courage here, friends? God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us His Spirit as assurance. He's given us His Spirit as power. And He wants all of you. He wants all of you. He wants to make you a super conqueror. He wants to make you powerful for God's kingdom. Not afraid. If you were to look back at the beginning of this book, you would see a very profound testimony in 116. For I am not ashamed of, the, of Christ, the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. He starts the letter by saying, I'm not ashamed of this. And here he's saying, based on all that Jesus has done for us, don't be ashamed either. You're a super conqueror. Nothing formed against you can defeat you. We don't just squeak by, Christians, limping into glory. No, I I pray that we rush the gates. We run in, arms wide, and say, God, I loved you. God, I served you. God, I, I stood for you. I lived for your glory. I don't want to just want us just to squeak by. I don't want us just to just to make it there. Let's take some ground while we're here to live as Christ, right? So in Christ we can stand powerfully against all assailants. If we suffer, we win. If we die, we win. In the end, we will conquer because of what Jesus did for us. Don't miss the end of that verse. This is, has nothing to do with your strength, I promise you. This has nothing to do with my strength, I promise you. We are conquerors how? Through him who loved us. That's how we conquer, because Jesus loves us. Not because you're awesome, but because Jesus loves you. Not because you're talented, but because God, because God loves you. You know, my friend Josh, he could, he could be playing just as beautifully and, and just as effectively, and just to, he could be displaying his talent just as profoundly in a bar somewhere. But he's not. He's delivering good news of Jesus Christ for God's glory because he's a super conqueror in Christ. God's given you talents. God's given you abilities. God's given you a platform. Don't hide. Don't. Don't waste your platform. Don't waste your talent. Don't waste your life. No, no. Get in the game. Get in the battle. Live for God's glory. He sent His Son for you. That's how you can do it. So we have victory through Christ against all assailants, and we have perseverance in God's love. Perseverance in God's love. Some powerful verses here, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So these ten things, they're, they're under a lot of debate. Scholar, like Some of the scholars are pretty confused as to why some of these things are in there. Like Why is angels in that list of something that could possibly keep us from God's word. And, and, and as you read all these commentaries, you'll see that the resounding scholarly answer to the question is, I don't know. I'm, I'm not real sure. But I think what, what Paul's doing here is he's just drawing extremes. He's drawing extremes. And in, in the earthly realm, neither, neither height nor depth. I mean, you're talking heavens or ground. No, no extreme can keep you from God's love. In the cosmic realm, in the supernatural realm, angels nor rulers, nothing in all of the supernatural realm can keep you from the love of Christ. Right? In time, either now or in the future, there's nothing on this earth. I I think Paul is just concerned that he doesn't leave anything out. Because he finishes it with, and nothing in all of creation. There is no thing that can separate you from God's love. If He loves you, if He's justified you, if He's sanctifying you, there is nothing that can separate that, that can stop that, that can quench God's love for you. Even you. Aren't you part of His creation? Nor anything else in all of God's creation can separate us from God's love 
for us. You could check John 10 if you want to, that these people are mine and no one can snatch them out of my hand, right? Hey, friends, not even you can break the bonds of God's love for you. Not even you can cancel your salvation. Not even you can cause God to quit on you. Not even you can cause him to give up on you. Nothing in all of creation. No little G God, no devil. No earthly power, no spiritual power. Nothing in all the universe can separate you from God's love for you. Isn't that amazing? You know why that is? Because he's the perfect father. He's the perfect father. Because, you know, I actually think that this verse is true about me and my dad, actually, and my mom. I don't think that there's anything in all of creation that could make my mom and dad stop loving me. For some of you, there's nothing in all the world that can make you stop loving your kid. Now, if we push that to extremes, maybe there is. But here's what I know. God is comfortable combating the extremes. He has no problem there. There is nothing in all the universe that can make God stop loving his kids. Why? Let's look at the very end. The very end. We're getting close to the end of this entire week. And I'm kind of sad, but also kind of happy because I'm kind of tired. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you are in Christ, there's no condemnation for you. If you are in Christ, there's no canceling God's love for you. If you are in Christ, there's no defeating you. There's no stopping you. There's no quenching God's love for you. There's no way that the enemy could ultimately defeat you. Could he defeat you in this world, maybe? Could he defeat your body? Yeah, sure, fine. But he could never rip away God's love from you. He could never take your soul. And I can take your life. And that does stink. That does hurt. But he can never have your soul. So the extremes of life as we know it, as we experience it, the supernatural world, time and space, none of it can keep you from the arms of Jesus. So how about we just celebrate? How about we just throw a Holy Spirit party because we're super conquerors because of the super love that God has for his kids? I want to finish <clears throat> tonight pretty much the same way we started, and that's with some scripture. Turn with me to Jude. The little letter, you might miss it if you're not looking for it um, particularly. It's the second to last book in all the Bible. It's only probably one page, maybe two in your Bible. <clears throat> and I just want us to read this and, and, and settle in this and wrap this text around our souls probably going to read it a couple times. Are you ready? Start in verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Now to him who is able. Friends, if you're in Christ, God will keep you there. If you're in Christ, no danger can assail you. If you're in Christ, he is able to keep you, to set you free. I don't know what it is you're facing today, but I promise you this. The one who's able to keep us from falling is able to meet your need. I know that because he promises it in his word. He loves his kids. He makes us super conquerors. God is good to us. So to him be glory and honor and dominion and power and majesty, not just now, but for all time. Amen. Would you close your eyes? I just want to 
ask a couple questions and maybe have a moment to reflect together. I want to know, have you been declared innocent? Has God taken up your case, applied the blood of Jesus to your heart, and made you righteous? If not, I I have to warn you. Before you leave here, I, I have to warn you. You stand no chance at trial. When you go into the heavenly courtroom, if you don't have Jesus as the star witness and God defending your case, friend, you're guilty. You don't have any hope. You can't measure up to God's standard, but there's a way out. There's freedom to be found in Jesus Christ. Trust Him as your defense. Ask Him to save you, to set you free. He will, and you can be a super conqueror in His name. If you have been made righteous in Christ, you can rejoice because no one can take that away from you. No danger can separate you from God's love. Rest easy, church. Your body might be in danger, but your soul is hidden with Christ in God. If you're facing one of these dangers that the Bible talks about, and you you feel like the accuser is trying to separate you from God, I want you to take heart. The devil can't have you. He won't win. Come and lay your burdens on this altar at the foot of the Savior. He will take up your case. He will make you a super conqueror. King Jesus, thank you for what you've done on our behalf. We thank you that you delivered the death blow to death. We thank you that you made a way for us to be accepted by God the Father. We thank you that in you we are children of the Most High God. We thank you you sent your Spirit as a seal of our inheritance. That You sent your Spirit to assure us of our salvation and to lead us into holiness. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your grace. And we ask now for your power. You would make us bold. You would make us victorious. We know you've taken up our case. Help us to be encouraged that we are safe in the arms of God the Father. And that nothing formed against us shall prosper. If God is for us, nothing can be against us. So we thank you, Lord. We celebrate together. In your name we pray.